Wow, we're now live and recording, says the message on my screen. I'm very happy to have all of you here. Uh, I believe that we're going to be covering a topic that's highly relevant uh, to anyone in Asia and in the world, really, which is the new role of Asian youth for post COVID. After this a very interesting period in the history of mankind, uh, we are looking forward to what's going to happen in 2021. We have a very distinguished panel uh, here with us today. Uh, I'll be doing the introductions uh, one by one uh, with a very a, a brief uh, explanation of where they're coming from, and then uh, the speakers will be uh, talking themselves about uh, what they're doing and uh, sharing the background from the perspective of youth. Uh, I would like to start with Peter Lazar, the founder of the Other Dots Foundation. And um, Peter, you know, we had a conversation before, your background is fascinating, so we're most welcome to please uh, share a little bit more about uh, what do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> Thanks, Marcelo, and uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, look, my, my background uh, has been a very interesting one, uh, traveling, living over four different continents. But uh, in, in, in essence, um, I'm, I've been investing and building ventures from the ground up for over uh, 20 years with three successful exits of my own. Um, I'm currently involved in building two ventures. One's a, a sports tech out of Singapore, but the other one, which is very interesting, is a UK foundation. Um, as you mentioned, it's called Other Dots, um, and its focus is about survival of life on the planet um, in a new world fair. And it's actually uh, very relevant to today's topic. Um, it's uh, the, 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 the new world fair, in essence, is a pitch to the youth. It's to come into this new world fair to showcase how they would build a better world to be part of a global community um, of makers rather than, than takers. And the new world fair... Um, is an open innovation and, and, uh, and challenge culture at scale. Um, and what we're basically doing is, is building a world game based on technologies, products, and systems, um, if you like, system realities of, of our planet. Um, so as, as we continue um, to tackle this really uh, surreal pandemic that we have um, around the globe today, for me, this is the, the best time for aspiring and youthful entrepreneurs to grab the opportunity and to help build a better world, regardless of the unprecedented challenges that, that we're facing. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, those who are willing um, to pursue this, this career, their career ambitions in, the, in, in entrepreneurship, what they need to do is to really study the market properly before investing in it. And what I mean by investing in it, meaning, you know, to carefully plan for taking the, the, this, this entrepreneurial journey that, that's needed. Um, some of the, uh, the key issues that can help um, entrepreneurs navigate through the challenges are things such as, you know, um, their persistence in, in crisis situations. And, and today we, ha we have got this crisis situation. So it's about being persistent in this, in this environment. How do we now go to build a better world? Um, you know, how do we navigate these new ventures through the hard times? So how would they do that? Um, how would, you know, for example, they can emerge and help others with these new ventures. And also the role of community is absolutely paramount in, in navigating um, this through, through the crisis. So, you know, um, an important point to make of all of this is that, that you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has certainly undermined the confidence of, you know, many executives, investors to a great extent. But it's, uh, you know, it, it is advised, if you like, to, for me, the young entrepreneurs, okay, this is their great moment. This is their moment to identify opportunities for augmenting profitability and joining um, and entering into, uh, and into businesses. And, uh, you know, um, I, I think it's, uh, it's for sure a great moment. This is what the Other Dots Foundation is all about. We want to bring everyone together as a global audience. We want them to, to help us build this new world. Um, and it's not about people dictating, governments dictating. It's not about waiting for the uh, for the wealthy to give funds to be able to us to do things. Um, you know, the Other Dots Foundation is really built around um, for as little as one dollar, you can be part of this global um, um, uh, alliance, if you like, this community where you know you participate in this, you help build this world. So you know, my my take with this, and you know. For starting the conversation off is is the entrepreneurial route. I just think it's uh, it's the right moment to, to do this, Marcelo. Well, fantastic, and it's actually a really nice bridge towards our next speakers. Uh, 
uh, Sinatis Zurujo, if I pronounced that correctly, Sinatis. Uh, 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 who's joining right, us? Thank you. TV. Thank you. Yeah, so Sinatis. Right, uh, my name. Yeah, so it's Sorry, just, introduce you you're here joining us the representing Demson capital but you do have a background with other industries so your experience personal in this case transitioning across industries is very very valuable but also when you're talking about entrepreneurship you have to talk about funding right and you're advising uh, or a company that focuses in capital so it would be great for us to uh, hear a bit more about uh, how you think uh, the Asian youth can benefit from access to capital in the future Right, right. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, again, I'm I'm currently right now the advisor to an advisor to Denson Capital, which is based in Singapore, and we advise entrepreneurs who are seeking uh, to expand their i their startups that have positive impacts to uh, society, but also to environment. And when we do look into this kind of investment, uh, especially now, you know, since COVID has really, really disproportionately affected the youth. Uh, so there will be, as Peter says, uh, you have to kind of look at the opportunity, new opportunities that there are out there. So in order to gain, you know, some sort of funding uh, that really makes sense to this kind of uh, pandemic right now, your idea really has to kind of uh, be sustainable uh, that is in within the new uh, workforce. And what I mean by the new workforce is that what we are seeing right now in the development in the world is that the old ways of working is no longer uh, the de facto way of working, meaning that you are able to do things that are, you know, cross boundaries now. You are, you know, <clears throat> if you're an entrepreneur and you're really wanting to work with clients, you know, it, it is now acceptable not to see them face to face, obviously. And so it's, there's a lot more flexibility in, in all of that. But at the end of the day, of course, you know, being a good entrepreneur is to actually have ideas. As what Peter said is actually really hit, you know, hit the mark. You really have to do the research in terms of what subject are you investing your time in it. And within this, you have to really look at uh, how the market is now developing. Don't just follow, you know, the, uh, the, the really the big keywords that are trending. You know, don't, you know, don't just fall for the trending keywords and hope that you can actually gain something out of that. Really do your research and really make sure that whatever that you are planning as a project uh, has the scalability. Uh, for, for us in Damson, like any other, v, you know, Impact VC, I would assume that, you know, you look at things that are scalable. You look at things that are really, really scalable because at times we do like some projects. However, when we look at the scalability, it's, you know, it becomes the, the breaking point. If it's not scalable, no matter how meaningful and good intention that you have, it's not going to go. You're not going to get the funding. So because, you know, a lot of the, uh, we, we look for, you know, to build businesses. You know, we, we do see the good points that people are making, you know, the good impact uh, that they want to achieve. Uh, but without the scalability, it's going to be difficult. So we are very open to entrepreneurs talking to us, you know, discussing in terms of, you know, how we may be able to help them. And what we do at Damson is not only helping in terms of funding. So we actually help also to, to guide, you know, the, the portfolios and how they can expand, uh, how they can grow as a company in terms of culture and in terms of, you know, the way that they set their, you know, roles and et cetera. And now, what we actually look into is uh, is helping a lot of the founders and how to basically engage in self care and how they can how they can actually take care of themselves better. At the pandemic level now, a lot of the issues that companies bigger companies are doing now they're you know they're obviously uh, loading off a lot of uh, workforce in order to survive. But a lot of companies are doing that uh, in in essence it's kind of like a, a positive thing for them because they were quite heavy already in the middle. So a lot of the, the old ways of working, a lot of company structures in the older ways where they have really heavy in the middle, they are now you know, having this case of where they're actually uh, making themselves trimmer, slimmer, and actually stronger. Now, a lot of the, the new ways of uh, looking at it for the young entrepreneurs is to, when you build your team, you have to build your team that are strong team, you know, to make the teams that are strong, not in terms of quantity of people, but in terms of making sure that you have the right quality of people. And that will save you down the road in you know, being ballooned up and being heavy, really heavy in cost. And that will have certainly help you to be more attractive to uh, PCs. 
So that would be my uh, my suggestions. Well, that's great, and it's also another good transition because we now uh, get uh, Kevin Lee from China Utility to join us. And um, in many ways, what Kevin is doing, and he's doing many things, uh, is uh, to help with the entrepreneurship, right? So he's trying to connect the youth to the larger corporations uh, because uh, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Uh, some people do need some guidance so when they're getting started with their career so they can see how companies are structured and all the challenges that they face before they jump into the uh, kind of adventure that require uh, VC backing, especially in the impact space where there are lots of uh, good intentions, but uh, not necessarily uh, people who can get all the pieces together. And that includes having an amazing team and uh, you know, understanding uh, how they function within that structure. So, Kevin, could you tell us a bit more about the work? and um, how this uh, entrepreneurship angle um, is being implemented in China, where youth will learn from the bigger corporations before they can be independent and do something themselves. Yeah, thanks, uh, Marcel. And uh, yeah, certainly uh, the company that I lead is called China Youthology. And uh, what we do is we do research and consulting, and we have been researching Chinese youth for the last uh, 10 plus years. Uh, and we're, we, we, we look at all different types of youth, but we focus on leading edge youth, those that are really creating new lifestyles and new ways of life and new ideologies that will trickle down and spread and change the entire population and the nation. And of course, the nation we're talking about and focusing on is China, the most populous and probably the most important nation of the next century. And so for us, it's really important to not just observe, but also to walk with and to inspire the next generation in how they're living their lives and creating their lives so that, you know, a generation can change and so that a society and a nation can continue to move forward in momentum. And, and what we do is we work not only with youth, but we connect them with uh, corporations and brands. And it's not just about uh, entrepreneurship within the companies, but it's really about how the companies learn to transform themselves to better serve and to better create a better life uh, for the next generation. Creating a better life doesn't mean easier, you know, it doesn't mean just like, you know, having things more fun, but it's really about things being more inspirational, being more meaningful, being more impactful and, uh, you know, and valuable for the next generation. And so that's really what we do. And part of that is not just telling CEOs how to change, but it's really about bringing young people into those companies in front of CEOs so that CEOs can understand, oh, this is actually how the next generation thinks and so they can change their minds as well. And it's really about collaborating, and because and, a lot of the new ideas and the best ideas are coming from young people themselves as they're creating their own lives. And so it's really about how to translate all those new ideas into things that other generations and corporations can adapt uh, and, and uh, learn, learn from in, in a better way. And so these are the things that we do uh, you know, at, at Youthology. But you know, to, to answer the question that we've been that we're posed with today, which is the role of Asian youth in post-COVID, and, and I'm coming from, again, looking from the Chinese perspective. I think one of the the top things or the banner things that we we hope to see and we are seeing today, you know, is is the hope for for Asian youth to move beyond consumerism. You know, it's that the reality is that before COVID and the last, especially for China, I mean, the youth all they're known for from everyone else is the market. They're the people that buy things. And so you just want to sell them things. And, you know, they're the people with money. And so just go sell young people. But, you know, young people are more than just consumers, you know. And the reality is that they actually have grown up only knowing themselves as consumers. They, they've grown up just thinking about who am I in terms of what I buy, you know, and how I spend my money. But with before COVID, but especially now with COVID, and, and, and I'm talking, of course, first from China, you know, you're seeing uh, the Chinese people starting to realize, okay, I'm not just a consumer anymore. This world is radically different. And I need to think about, about myself and my role in society beyond just what I consume. You know, and, and this has a lot to do, again, with China, because China has built its, and the government has built its social contract around, you know, of course, GDP growth and the growth of the economy. Well, in a year where, you know, <laughs> the economy has completely, uh, you know, a lot of Oh, uh, yeah, cool. it looks like... Can you guys uh, hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. you're back. I'm back. Okay, sorry about that. You know... It's nothing about the government, and then it disappears, so we're concerned for you for a while. Okay, sorry about that. 
uh, what I was saying was, you know, we're, we're at a moment, especially in China, but in, in many Asian societies, where we have to rethink about, uh, you know, uh, the, the social contract. And so young people have to step up and have to take a, a more important uh, role. You know, it's not just about being consumer. It's really about how to be an actor, how to have a voice and how to create new purpose, you know? And, and purpose today, young people are looking for purpose everywhere because it's no longer about making more money. It's no longer about spending more money. You know, young people are asking tougher questions about, well, what do we do in this world? And they're actively exploring it. But the issue is, once they start to find those things, can it be translated, can it be heard by society, by the government, so that the government society can also change what the social contract can be and also change what the narrative of what aspiration in society can be. It is no longer about making money to advance and to rise up. It's no longer about that, but we need a new narrative and that new narrative has to come from young people. And so that's really the hope of the, of the role of, of, of uh, Asian youth, which is to try to find that new narrative for most of those Asian societies and economies. The other thing that I want to say is also around, you know, this past month, we've seen, you know, the signing of a whole new, you know, trade, uh, trade block, right, in, in Asia. And that's super exciting. You know, and, and I think that, that this is something that's really interesting, especially as we look post-COVID, because through the COVID period, we've seen a lot of economies and societies shut themselves up. And it's not just, of course, the borders, but, you know, especially from some of the Western countries, we've seen some ideologically shutting up, you know, like, you know, they, they're, they're going away from globalization. They're going more into isolate, isolation. Well, this new trade pact is, is an important uh, shift in, in, in global society, right, where we're seeing a shift toward, you know, where Asia might be taking the lead in terms of globalization. There needs to be more work that has to be done. And the role for Asian youth in this is that, you know, especially for Asia, youth are, are the best in adapting, are the best in empathy, are the best in understanding other people, right? And, and that's what's needed in, the, in this next few years. You know, if this trade pact is going to really uh, work for the next generation, this generation, this next youth generation, have to learn how to really embrace the, the cultures of the other, other Asian cultures. Right. I mean, Chinese youth have to go and really spend much more time in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Thailand, in, in Korea, in Japan. Now, now Chinese youth get this in, in media. They get to watch the, the movies and the stories. And, and a lot has been done in the, on the media side. But media and watching a character on film is radically different than going and meeting somebody and having a conversation with them and building a relationship with them. That's a whole different level of empathy that is, that is necessary for this type of trade pact and for true globalization to continue and to fi find a future in the, fu in, in, in the next generation. And so that's what we really need because honestly, Asian youth, they might go to other countries as tourists, but again, that's only as a consumer. And they're not going as collaborators or connectors. They're not going as creators. Right. And so that's really what's necessary. I really hope that the government, you know, of, of these Asian societies can really think about how do you enable young people to have international experiences that are truly collaborative, not just consumption based. You know, so how can they push and inspire young people to go out there and have true empathy with other young people of other cultures? That's the only way to actually strengthen, you know, globalization and trade and communication and connection, which is what we desperately need. For the next generation. I'll stop it there, but I'm sure there's lots that we can talk about in the panel upcoming. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, yeah. The, the, thank you so much. This is actually a, a great uh, uh, segue, but uh, I'd like to mention that one of the reasons why uh, the European Union kind of works sometimes, or it likes to complain about it, but it's really amazing. You know, we haven't had uh, you know, any serious conflicts within the continent. That's debatable, no? Uh, depending on what you define as Europe, we just had a war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, so that's uh, kind of the greater uh, scope of the region. But uh, elements such as the decision to establish the Erasmus program, where students from different European countries, and not only the EU countries, but you know, it's a much greater scope, they can spend some time uh, in other countries, learn new languages and different cultures is so incredibly powerful. Usually when you come across so, someone who's done something remarkable and they uh, are Europeans, they grew up here, uh, there is a mention somewhere that they've participated in the Erasmus program. So if you haven't heard about it, I, I highly recommend uh, reading more uh, in terms of what Erasmus created. And it's very 
um, subdued, right? It's just there. It's just easy to access, and people take it almost for granted. But it, as far as I know, it doesn't exist in Asia. Like you don't have a program where you can say, oh, uh, I am uh, uh, Indonesian and I want to go to Korea. I think Sinatus is Indonesian in Korea, but that's uh, you know, later in his life because of professional directives. It's not because I like K-pop and uh, I would like to understand a bit more about BTS from a deeper philosophical perspective, if that actually exists. But um, there is a level of interest and attraction uh, that is very individual but there isn't a conduit that facilitates the process of getting Indonesians to Korea and vice versa and then across the whole region. And I do believe that this is something that uh, uh, the, the new facts that are being established in, the, in a pan-Asian perspective, they have to look into that uh, more seriously. Because the U.S. has programs sending people like U.S. aid and uh, lots of scholarships to uh, get uh, someone from Stanford to go to Oxford and they're road scholars, wonderful. I mean, this is kind of the creme de la creme, the, uh, the top uh, of the intellectual firepower that the US has, and they uh, have this opportunity to live abroad. But it happens at all levels, right? Even if you're a bad student, you can join one of those programs and just spend some time in a different country trying to figure out um, what's your purpose in life. And in Asia, my perspective as a Brazilian, actually, who lives in Europe, so it's like the, I'm the least Asian of uh, uh, the whole group here. But my perspective as an outsider is that Asia could enormously benefit from that. But uh, no, it's not my session. I'm just here to moderate. I'd like to give the word to Yash, who is a young entrepreneur. So um, if, if you need any capital, you already know uh, Senatus. He can advise you on how to uh, scale uh, your um, um, platform. And uh, the one thing I'd like to mention, uh, Yash, maybe you can comment on that, is that there is uh, a movement now towards establishing shadow boards where larger corporations have one of the younger members of the staff joining certain board meetings not the ones talking about strategy at the you know, more secret level but having someone from the kind of the fresh perspective you know a few months or years in the company but in the still relatively junior in the pecking order joining board meetings so they can, uh, as Scott mentioned, uh, you know, provide that kind of perspective. How, how do you see that? I mean, please tell us a bit more about what you do, but uh, uh, that would be my question to you, uh, the idea of shadow boards and how that could be implemented successfully. Thank you so much, Marcelo. Thank you so much for uh, having me in this panel. And now coming to the part what what we do is I'm the founder of a company called Biopapro. Uh, we manufacture biodegradable products, alternatives of single-use plastic, uh, so as you know, European Union has gone for a ban from 5th July 2021 where they will not be using plastic straws, cups. These are small initiatives with the plastic where, where the impact is much, much higher when it comes to things. And now coming to the part about uh, the shallow board members, like how you said, to be part of it. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I think it is much more needed for the youth to be part of the main decision making. Uh, especially when it comes to huge corporations. When uh, Let's take an example of Domino's and Good Airlines, uh, Jubilant Foods. Uh, they still use plastic, uh, even though they have such good in, uh, information about the alternatives being available. There is so much more uh, sustainable things that they can do uh, in just changing the small, small changes. Like they were giving us masks and face shields. While we were entering, it was wrapped in a plastic packet. It could have been done in a paper bag. It could have been done in a paper box. It is a very small initiative which each individual companies can take in, which can help all the other people. And especially when it comes to, you know, like companies which are benchmarks that people look up to. If you are doing it, people are going to follow you sooner or later. Um, India is going towards it. Um, mostly by 2022, India should be away from single-use plastic ban. We should be able to implement that uh, because of the Paris Convention, how we've been part of the climate change treaty in the Paris. Uh, apart from that, I think, Senatus, yes, definitely, I would love to get in touch with you. Um, I really believe that uh, it would be a great uh, product that we are working on. It's a very scalable uh, product. Like Just a small example, the United States consumes almost 500 million plastic straws each day. Uh, that's roughly around 35 to 40 containers of uh, paper straws that can be supplied. Now, the costing part of it, I think uh, the paper straws have almost been able to be economically friendly towards the plastic straws. Uh, so it should help, and we can definitely scale up a lot more considering India's uh, cheap labor. 
also takes into the place uh, that the manufacturing activities are really, really uh, economically friendly. When it comes to this, we do not have the best of the technologies when it comes to machineries. When it comes to large scale productions, which China is able to achieve, but definitely having some expertise from different backgrounds will help us out in creating a better future. We'd love to, Yash. We'd love to hear your story. Sure, thank you. Great. So yeah, we're getting some answers down here. This is an incubator somehow uh, of ideas. <laughs> and uh, talking about incubating ideas, uh, I would like to wrap the um, uh, introductions with uh, uh, Tanisha uh, Alpha Resekar. Uh, this is uh, no a, a, a tricky one. So I yeah. hope it was good enough. And um, yeah. you're the founder of uh, Laka Tantra. You work with media. So. Uh, why don't you tell us a bit more about what you do? And you get those uh, four different messages from different countries, with different perspectives. And you tell us um, you know, uh, how we're going to be summarizing that in the article you publish about our session. So, hi, I'm um, a social entrepreneur. Lokatantra is a social enterprise that works towards bridging the gap between politicians and voters in India. And um, so one of the questions that we were proposed for this panel is how we can empower the youth. And before I sort of propose our solution to that, I'd just like to run you all through some numbers. 60% uh, of India's population is below the age of 29. And India's median age is 27.9. In comparison to this, the average age of a member of parliament in India is 63 in the upper house and 52 in the lower house. Um, other Asian countries do not compare significantly better than India in this regard, considering that in Japan, the average age of a diet member is 55, and the average age of a Chinese member of the National People's Congress is 52. Um, one of the best things we can do as a continent to empower our youth, considering, like Mr. Lee said, we are much more than just consumers. We are also voters that have the sort of ability to create impact and change in the world we live in today is to encourage youth civic participation and engagement. Um, over the past two decades, this is a topic that has acquired quite a bit of prominence in research policy and practice in many parts of the world, especially at the international level because the World Bank has identified um, that the exercise of active citizenship can help solve a lot of problems, including um, market differences in the number of violent spaces in a country, um, more public awareness about people's right to have their voices heard. It can. This is a means to an end, but it is also an end in itself because there's a lot of objectives and benefits that it can give to society. Um, it can help curb injustices, improve welfare. And um, the one thing that we can do to sort of make this youth civic engagement happen is to increase youth civic participation by reducing the age requirement for participating in elections, which um, in the case of India and Japan, for example, is 25 if you want to contest for the lower house and 30 if you want to contest for the upper house. Um, if there's one thing we've learned from the responses of countries such as New Zealand or even Finland during this pandemic, it's that having young leaders is, um, is good. Young leaders, when presented with the opportunity um, and a challenge to be able to show responsibility, have definitely proved themselves. And um, like sort of was touched upon by a lot of people in this panel, um, the youth in the world, but also in Asia, considering that it is the biggest demographic dividend, has infinite potential. And allowing them to come up with the policies to sort of empower themselves and decide on the reforms that they need to be able to do better for their country, the continent and the world at large should be left to them. And allowing them to participate and take up more roles as elected officials is definitely one way of sort of achieving that. So I'd like to wrap up over there. All right. Thank you so much, Tanisha. I um, just um, realized that we, uh, I haven't covered during our preparations the gender issue, right? So you mentioned young leaders. They also happen to be female in yes. New Zealand yes. and uh, you know, Finland and all that. Just tiny mm -hmm. little detail. Um, yeah. Guys, now that we finish this first part, and so I have 15 minutes to go, um, 
I offered a little bit of a menu in terms of should we discuss purpose and Ikigai, should we discuss mobility. But um, I'd like to add to that the uh, gender balance from an Asian perspective in terms of uh, the youth finding their purpose, uh, but also you know, finding more equality when it comes to giving opportunities uh, to both genders. And um, anyone who would like to pick one of those topics and jump in, you're most welcome. Uh, keeping in mind that we have uh, 14 minutes left, and I would like to have at least one minute for the final words and uh, any questions you, you have at the end. I, I, myself, if it's okay, I mean, I, I, I think the, uh, the gender issue is, 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 a, is, a, is a big issue, needs to be tackled. I do think, uh, um, I, I think, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of the, if you just look at governments around the world, it's very driven by uh, male orientated. But then when you go to New Zealand, for example, you, you know, the, uh, the, the new prime, you know, well, the, the ex prime minister has been re-elected. She's done a tremendous job um, in running the country. Um, and I, I think uh, I think it really needs to be tackled. And I think this is the if uh, just going back to, uh, uh, to Tanisha's point about the you know bringing more youth into the political system. Um, I think the more that we can have a more of an entrepreneurial mindset coming into the political youth system, I think will, that that will add um, to helping with the balance with uh, with uh, bringing more um, female representation. Um, you know, I, I think there's also, there's always a balance, right? When you, when you, you know, uh, I, I, just as a, as an example, and it's an old example, but I'll give you one. It's like my, my parents, bless them. Okay. My, my father had no idea about how to manage money and, and you know, and, and how to pay bills and whatever, but my mum was doing everything. Okay. So the decision maker in, in my, my household was my mum, right? My father was more the stern, strict Greek guy. Um, so I, I think there's, uh, I, I think. For me, um, it, it's actually paramount that we try to open and, and I guess, take the blinkers off. Um, and I think it's time for people to realize that it's time for the youth. Um, you know, we, as, as old guys, uh, I put my health off in this bracket here as an, old, as an older guy in this group here. Um, you know, we, we sort of get blamed for why the world is the way it is today. Um, so, you know, I'll hold my hands up, but indirectly, I guess we all participate in it. But I, I think it's today is just absolutely the right the right moment in this this whole pandemic world for the youth to step up um, and take it, excuse the expression by the balls and, and go with it. Um, and I think male female it really needs to be a, a collective. Um, and the more we can um, bring in that that's what other dots is all about is bringing this opportunity where people can come into this new world and, and prove that it can be built by the younger generation. Um, and uh, look, the old school is great because that's all the, you know, the knowledge, the content, the experience they can bring. But let the youth run it now and we be the guide to helping them you know, in the right directions. So that's my, you know, just want to put my two pence. Yeah, the, the older generation usually acts as a benchmark of what uh, could have been done or what was achieved. Uh, the, the issue there uh, with the, a younger representation uh, gaining political power is that people in power don't really seem to agree with that concept, right? So you need to figure out a way where the younger generations can gain the ability to have that power without feeling threatening to the older generations. And there are lots of initiatives like the Model United Nations where they can understand uh, how to represent the countries. They're all uh, mock uh, in uh, many ways. Um, there was a case, and this is a really interesting topic to hear uh, your opinions on, uh, the the COP conference, COP26, uh, was uh, no, unfortunately uh, not um, done as planned. And a group of uh, youngsters decided to have the mock COP. And um, no, a few days ago, they had um, uh, lots of Gen Z millennials uh, getting together, uh, creating a parallel conference to COP26. They literally said, okay, you know, if, if you guys can't get it done, this is too important for us to leave behind. We do our own, right? So the idea of shadow boards and creating parallel power structures where you don't really control a budget, you don't really control an army, you don't really control the decision-making process, but at least you're learning how to do that once you're in a position to challenge the older generation. So any comments on uh, this kind of a side wheels, uh, learning how to ride a bike uh, approach and how we can best do it in Asia? I actually think it's a great idea. In fact, um, there are countries that are also working on having 
more parliaments for the youth where they can sort of come in and have these discussions and sort of act like speakers and parliamentarians for a day. And I feel like it's a great way of encouraging that idea of engagement in being involved from a young age, especially because, like you said, um, there's still this concept of ageism, at least in India. I'm not sure about how much it applies to other countries, where um, the youth is still sometimes regarded in this unfair lens of being um, irresponsible or not experienced enough to sort of make important decisions or participate in decision making, which I feel like is a sort of perspective that we're moving away from, but I feel like we can move away from it a little faster. So that's my opinion. Just to add, you know, when you look at some of the amazing ventures that have been built around the world, that's all from the young, young entrepreneurs. Yeah. I mean, you just, just take Facebook alone. Okay. Yeah. That's just one. This is Mark Zuckerberg. He, how young was Mark Zuckerberg when he, when he set this up? So I, I think there's a big, I, I think it's, um, I, I think it's a blinkered approach by the, the, the older generation to think that the younger generation don't have the, the capacity. For sure, there's a lot of knowledge that needs to be learned, but you've got okay. to give the opportunity uh, for it to happen. So the shadowing part, as you're saying, Marcelo, um, can be very, very influential. I mean, I, I, I work very closely with a, an organization called Think the Unthinkable. Uh, and these are two very, very reputable, uh, Nick Gowing and, and Chris Langdon, a BBC you know, broadcasters and journalists. Um, so much knowledge. And they are all for the youth to try and come forward and, and, and help build a better world and help this whole climate issue, for example. You know, how can we do it? So... You know, I think for us to sit back and say that uh, there isn't a forum for the younger generation to come in, I think that's wrong. I think we need to. I think that's where we need to be creative. We need to be entrepreneurial. Um, and we need to have that passion and desire to make it happen. So uh, I'll back that all the way. And that's, again, uh, I'll throw other dots in because that's exactly what other dots is all about. Come into this new world fair uh, and, and help deliver this, this better world that we want to build. Yeah. If I were to jump in and uh, um, just talk about the gender issue as uh, as we're talking about right now, uh, just to come at it from a very different perspective, because uh, obviously you guys have been talking about representation, uh, the gender issues in, in representation, and obviously coming from China, rep- representation has a whole completely different uh, issue with it. So gender is very far down the list of, of uh, topics when it's about representation in China. Um, so it's not really about representation, but, uh, so, but at Ufology, we, we watch, uh, the gender issue very closely and there's been a lot of movement. We're very excited about the movements around the gender issue, uh, because even though it's not a representation within the government structure, uh, what we are working on is better representation when it comes to the media. You know, that's another area that you can think about representation if it's not in the governmental or in, in, you know, in those types of structures. In the media, it's equally as important, if not more important, because, of course, it forms uh, popular perception. And so for us, we've been, we've been working very closely with, uh, with how the Chinese are growing, and especially the, young, the youngest generation, have grown or still naturally have uh, accepted um, a diversity of gender norms. You know, so it's not about just male, female, uh, you know, equity. It's about gender norms and the diversity of them. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the whole area around LGBTQ, but also on top of that, the changing, the changing discourse around masculinity, you know, and femininity, you know, I- even in the hetero sense and the different roles that they're playing. These are radically, uh, contentious issues, um, that have a lot of room to play. Uh, and a lot of cultural uh, significance in China. So we work with, you know, brands to help push that envelope forward to talk about these issues in media, in, you know, paid advertising or in other things to be able to put that in front of the populace so they can start to recognize, hey, this gen- these, there are many different aspects to the gender issue and many things that we can deal with, you know, on a day-to-day basis. So it's exciting. I think that China is moving very quickly in this area and there's a lot of movement uh, it's, it's something that we're looking at very quickly. Cool. Just a quick comment. Uh, we have uh, four minutes left. Um, uh, it's important to realize that uh, when uh, the older generations criticize the younger ones for being uh, 
irresponsible. I think that is uh, otherwise responsible, right? Uh, the meaning is in your money is not something that someone with a hedge fund absolute returns mentality can understand. Like, would you like to have double the money or clean beaches without dead seagulls that choke on plastic? So it, this gets very subjective, but it's also very measurable in so many ways. And I think that uh, you, we need to have this conversation, right? Try to explain to the older generations that the younger ones don't really care about the same things. They're not as paranoid about having the consumerism element that um, you know, Kevin discussed before. But um, uh, we have a few minutes left, so anyone would like to you know, establish a new topic uh, and then uh, wrap it from there? I'm actually going to add something regarding the gender here, Marcello. I mean, uh, a couple of things. The last four out of uh, three out of four companies that I've reviewed in the last few months were all female led, you know, uh, female led entrepreneurs. In Indonesia, I think we have, uh, you know, the gender issue is there for sure, but we are blessed with a society where women play a huge role, not only in homes, but also in leadership. So, you know, and the one thing that I'm gonna actually twist this angle, the one thing that we actually have to be careful with in gender, it's not from the elder people, it's actually from the younger people too. And in cases where I see in companies where driven by young, you know, uh, younger generation companies, uh, you know, I, there, there are times where I see equality, but there are also times where I, you know, more than often at the higher level, I see inequality. I see where, you know, just, there's this whole thing with the whole startup scene that, you know, this, whole canvassing of like the, I call it the alpha male syndrome. Every time you go into like a tech entrepreneur, you'll be walking into like this den of wolves of everyone needs to be kind of, I know everything. And the thing is, you know, when and we're talking about shadowing people who are, you know, who are more experienced, who are older, I think that's very, very important for someone, whether you are male or female, to put yourself as a CEO as in, in, on, on your title, it doesn't really mean much until, you know, what I love to say, until you know how to fire people. Because, you know, you're talking about running a company. It's a living, breathing, or organic thing. You know, you are in, you know, you are in care of a lot of people at the end of the day as well. So, you know, you have to have the right mindset, the right framework, and also the right sensitivity and how to approach it. And the younger generation, I would say, you know, you you know they have a lot of opportunities right now because everything is so fast information is all there and the right information is the one that they need to focus on not because that you feel that you are more experienced because you are you know that you work out of you know consultancy firm you know for the last two years and then you started up a company you got to listen to everyone you got to be able to look at that and you know i see this also in terms of uh, environment issues you know, like a lot of the younger generations are in the forefront of environment issues. But how many of them hold, you know, disposable iPhones, iPhones that can't be fixed, right? So you got to actually look at it back, you know, from a, from a neutral standpoint of view where we all should learn from everyone, not only from the younger, we should learn from the older, you know, the elders. We should also learn from one another and different cultures, as you know, uh, as Kevin has mentioned as well. Oh, that's great, guys. We uh, have uh, 30 seconds left, so I have to wrap now just uh, to uh, keep to on the program. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I'll do my little plug now I'm, uh, here representing Wisdom Accelerator for Youth, which focuses on teenagers, so definitely in the Gen Z uh, category. And um, we are trying to do many things to solve the problems we discussed today. Uh, we try to have a gender balance um, program with more than 200 speakers, around uh, at least one third of them are women. And uh, we try to uh, create uh, opportunities for mentorship. So many of our speakers, they will be able to have interns who are teenagers but working from home with the parent supervision. And there are lots of things that can be done. Right? We, uh, we can talk a lot about it, uh, but uh, let's make sure they're doing just as much and that uh, there's a more hopeful future for the youth uh, after the COVID uh, uh, context that we have, and that's um, apparently around the corner. So that's uh, commemorates to the light at the end of the tunnel. And thanks again for joining, and uh, enjoy the rest of our rises. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Yeah. It's been a pleasure, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Marcelo. Yeah. Thanks, Marcelo. Cheers. Cheers.